made these seven I am statements. You know, I'm, I tend to really hone in on Yeshua's words. I, I always hone in on the red letters because as the master, as the Messiah, as the Lord, he's the one that's supposed to lead us. And so his words to me are crucial, very crucial. We have a caller. Just, yeah. Um, these, so here's this, this Messiah, you know, this, this God-man, um, the Word of God who was with God always in the beginning and, and became incarnate. His words are the words you need to focus on. You know, there's a lot of great quotes, there's a lot of wonderful people that say wonderful things, but that's what you really need to focus on, his words. And he just makes these seven statements, and we've gone over two already. You know, I am the bread of life, and I am the light of the world. Powerful. These are powerful. You could talk about them forever. You can't exhaust them. Powerful, powerful, powerful statements. Today, the two we're going to go over is, they're just incredibly endearing. I, I don't know how else to say it. I mean, and hopefully you'll, you'll see uh, what, what I've found in these statements. I'll do my best, and hopefully where I fall short, because I will, the Holy Spirit will make up more than enough for you to get the picture. That's my prayer. So let's look at the first one. It's uh, in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. All the seven great I Am statements were in the, the ch uh, Gospel of John. It's the ninth verse, and it says, I am the gate. This is Yeshua speaking. If someone enters through me, he will be safe and will go in and out and find pasture. Um, this is the third, as I said. We, we mentioned two others already. This is the third of these seven I am declarations. And Yeshua is making them in regards to his unique identity. He's claiming his unique identity and also his purpose. Okay, it's very important to know a person's purpose, especially when he's your Lord and Savior. Yeshua was saying here, it's very, it's very simple in a sense, I'm the way to salvation. I'm the way to salvation. But you're going to see there's a little bit more to it. Okay? These, these statements that he makes, I tell you, they're, they're easy for a child to understand, but they're deep enough for the greatest scholar to, to not exhaust. Our faith is not in a creed. Okay? Our faith is not in a church, okay? It's in a person. It's very important that you understand that. Salvation can only be received through Messiah, Yeshua. Baptism will not do. Church attendance will not do. Nor will good works. We must enter by Yeshua and those who do enter by Yeshua are saved from the penalty of sin. Not the power of sin and not the presence of sin. Just the penalty. At that point, you are saved from the penalty of sin. You won't go through the penalty of, of the wages of sin. But after that, and we're not going to get into that right now, I just want you to know, after that, post that, we're to be delivered from the power of sin. That's what this life is all about, the believing life, the power of sin. That's that the God who was delivers us from the penalty. That happened. The God who is right now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, de delivers us from the power of sin. The God who is to come, the one who is to come, will put us in a glorified state. That will deliver us from the very presence of sin. Okay, those are the, that's the, those are the three stages. Justification. And sanctification and glorification. It's, it's just basic, very basic Bible. Okay? Yeshua is saying here, I am the gate. I am the gate. I'm the way. Now, I want you to see something. I'd like you to see something that I think personally is unbelievably cool. And I'm sure most of you know this already, but I'm sure some of you, this is going to be new news. Look at how this chapter starts, okay, in the first three verses. And Chapter 10, he says, yes, indeed. What did I tell you about that? Assuredly, yes, indeed. He's saying, listen up. Like, pay attention, okay? I tell you, the person who doesn't enter the sheep pen through the door or the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. 
But the one who goes in through the gate is the sheep's own shepherd. This is the one the gatekeeper admits, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep and each one by name and leads them out. Now, I want you to notice something. This, to me, is way cool. In, in the first verse that I read to you, in the ninth chapter, Yeshua says, I am the gate. Here, Yeshua is saying, I came through the gate. Right? It's really a major, it's almost a conundrum. It's almost confusing. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You said you came through a gate. Now you're saying you are the gate. Which one is it? It's two totally different situations. Okay? The gatekeeper here is the Lord. And the gate, the gateway, he's not only the gateway of salvation, but he also entered through the gate. In order for anyone to claim to be the Messiah, they had to go through this gate called the 333 prophetic prophecies about Messiah. His birth, his life, his ministry, his death. That person had to fulfill. There were other ones. There were many who claimed to be Messiah. The Orthodox community in Brooklyn think Menachem Schneerson was the Messiah. They still do. You're going to think this is crazy, but some of them actually believe that he's rolling underground and that he will pop up at the proper time in Jerusalem. But he did not fulfill. I don't care what their theory is. The bottom line is he was a really great rabbi and a scholar and a lover of souls, but he did not fulfill the 333 prophecies. He did not. So he can't claim to be Messiah. Now, at this point when Yeshua was saying this, there were still some that were to be fulfilled. They weren't all fulfilled yet. But he's saying in advance, I shall fulfill all because I am Messiah. Now, he said others claimed it, and others still claim after him. But they're thieves and robbers. Now, are thieves and robbers the same? No. Otherwise, you'd be redundant. What's the difference? I don't know. Who cares? Guys, I, I do this not to be sarcastic or not to be the answer man, but you're reading the same Bible I'm reading. Or you think you were. You, you know, I'd want to know this. Me personally. I, if I read that, I was like, what? Thieves are those who take what don't belong to them. Robbers are those who use violence to do so. You just got to look it up in the Greek. I don't know all the Greek. I don't know every word. It's not like I got this down. I'm learning with you. I look it up and I say, oh, okay, there's the difference. Now look at verses 7 through 9. Okay? So Yeshua said to them again, I'm going to put in a little context. You know how important that is. Yes, indeed, assuredly, I tell you that I am the gate for the sheep. So he's saying, I am the Messiah, but I'm also the way to salvation. I came in through the proper way. I am the Messiah, and now you have to go through me to get to him. You ever see that? When we were young, we were kind of rough, and we hung out in rough places, and I had some friends, and to get to me, you had to go through them. Yeshua was saying, I came so you would know the Father, but you cannot get to the Father around me. you got to go through me. All those who have come before me have been thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. They didn't. I am the gate. If someone enters through me, he'll be safe and go in and out and find pasture. I want you to know something. This is there's no offense, but living here, you know, I've met a lot of what I would call cultural Christians. You know, they go to church, they've never been born again. They're not even sure what that term means. Even though the Bible clearly says, you have to be born again. <laughs> it's a prerequisite. They almost go, are you one of those born-again Christians? It's duplicity. There's no such thing as an unborn-again Christian. To be a Christian, you have to be born again by definition. So if you're not born again, ma'am, what are you? I had somebody say, you one of those born-again Christians? Are you asking me if I a Christian Christian? So a lot of people that I've met down here, even people that love Yeshua, they stop at the door. You don't stop at a door. You don't stop on a bridge. 
If you want to get from New Jersey to New York City, you've got to go over the GW. Okay? If you stop on the GW, you're never going to get to the city. If you stop at Yeshua, you'll never get to the Father. He said, I've come so you'll know the Father. He, he's the only entity, the only being, if you will, that can grab onto heaven and grab onto earth. Nobody else can do that. But if you stop at a door, if you went into the vestibule and stopped at the door and just, oh, I love the door, I love the door, you'd never get into the sanctuary. And the door's locked. Yeshua's locked. What is, you need a key. What is the key? A true repentance and profession of faith. That unlocks the door and gets you into the kingdom. And once you get into that kingdom, the kingdom has a whole new set of rules. It's not like this world. It's a different world. And it has a different set of rules. And once you get into that kingdom, you learn those rules so you can abide in the kingdom. That's salvation and sanctification. That's all it is. These terms, though, go in and out. That, that, if you look up Deuteronomy 28.6... What did you do to it? I don't even... I, <laughs> listen. What did I do Hold on, to hold on, hold on. How long do you know me? Have you ever in your life was the ringer ever on on my phone? Ever? You said yourself ever? you did not sleep. So evidently, that was you. Don't let that happen again. You should have seen her face when she went for a phone, though. She looked at me like... Thought she was having Bell's palsy. <laughs> All right. Sorry for the interruption. I don't know what happened. I never, I don't even know how the ringer went on. I never have, I never, ever, I don't care if I'm expecting a call. I wouldn't have the ringer on. Nope. 28.6, let me just show you what it says. It says, a blessing, Deuteronomy 28, speaking about the blessings and the curses. Listen, in life, every decision you make, either blessing or cursing will be attached to it. There is no neutrality to any decision you'll ever make. Do, do you know why we have six tribes on one side and six tribes on the other? God designed that. Do you know about Mount Ebal and Mount Gerasim? Where six tribes stood on Mount Gerasim and announced the blessings as the people were entering into the land? They were delivered. You're delivered. They were delivered from Egypt. They were delivered from darkness. Now they're coming into the land, into the kingdom, if you will. We're in the kingdom. But in that kingdom, you could be either very blessed or very cursed. You could be incredibly saved and incredibly cursed at the same time. So every time you walk in here, it's not just go, oh, look at the pretty windows. That wasn't the point. The point was to let you know and let your children know that every decision you make in life is going to bring either blessing. You didn't know you guys were sitting on the cursed side. <laughs> So he's going over the blessings and the curses. He wants, he wants you to know this is what you've got to teach your children. You don't just teach your children do's and don'ts. Let them know their decisions. No man's an island. It affects everybody. You screw up the whole universe. So he says a blessing on you when you go out and a blessing on you when you come in. It's covenant terminology. Your God, I know we don't hear this much today in the churches. Your God is a covenant maker and a covenant keeper. He is in a spiritual, intimate contract with you. He's saying, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to provide. I'm going to sustain. I'm going to, 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 I'm going to. And then you're going to do something too. It's not going to be a one-way street. Nobody likes that. Haven't you had that friend that just calls you when they need something? You know, and then, and then they disappear. And then all of a sudden, they reappear because they need something. And you don't want to tell them how you really feel, but you got to. You got to let them know. You don't have to be mean about it, but you got to let them know. Otherwise, they'll never change. Nobody ever tells them. 
Nobody likes that one-way street. It has to be mutually beneficial. Nobody likes a taker. So God's the same way. He's like, look, I'm giving and giving and giving. All you want to do is take. It's covenant terminology going in and out, in and out. It's a picture of perfect security and freedom that we have. We go into God's presence through Yeshua. We go into God's presence, the holy presence of God that only one Jewish man one time a year was allowed to go in and frightfully so. Mikfaring and praying and confessing and going in, shaking one time to just see some smoke of God's presence, a vapor of God's presence, a smidge one time. Nobody else can go. Nobody else can touch it. And he'd have to put in incense to hide the presence of God. And now we get to go in and speak to Almighty God and address him with the Hebrew word that is the most endearing word in the Hebrew language. And make no mistake, Adam spoke Hebrew. All his children were called Hebrew names. Where do you think he got the language from? It was the way God communed with him. We get to go into the presence of Almighty God and say, Abba, Father. You're talking to a former Orthodox Jew, man. That blows me away. I wouldn't have bought that from nobody if they told me. I would have thought it was heretical, blasphemous at best. Blasphemous at best. So we go in, we go in, and then what? I mean, we have this freedom and the security that we can come and go. But you go into God's presence to receive from God. You don't want to hold that to yourself. You want to go out and give it out, right? You go in and get the light, go out and shine the light. You go in and get the light, go out and shine the light. The Lord's blessed you, bless somebody else. When I was preaching all over in South America, bendecidos para bendecir. You've been blessed, so be a blessing. can't keep taking nobody likes that i've met some people here no offense but they're just takers they sit they do nothing they don't even give i just know that i don't check but i just know that and then when they're ready to leave i'm like good you just got in the way you weren't doing anything you were dead weight it sounds wow rabbi that's so nasty maybe that's why you don't have tons of people look i have who i have Okay? God sends who he wants. It doesn't change the message, the number of people. I've been preaching the same message when I had 12 people and when I have 500 people or 10,000 people. I don't care. The message doesn't ch- change, man. It doesn't change. But dead weight? You don't want dead weight in your house. Everybody pulls their weight in our house. Everybody has a job. Ain't no dead weight. No, no. We, if there was dead weight in our house burning, I would say, I'm sorry, you've got to join another family. And then find pastor. I mean, not only is Yeshua Savior and the one who gives freedom, but he's provider, he's sustainer, and he's satisfier. You should be so satisfied. You should be so satisfied with your relationship with the Lord. It should be the ultimate satisfaction. There's other things that satisfy me. Hanging out with Bernard the last few days was fantastic. Just fantastic. I say to all the time, we have the best time together. I'm like, what are we doing? So, so when do we not have a good time? When we're around our kids and we're around the synagogue. Let's quit and give them up for adoption. It's an easy fix. I mean, it's a no-brainer. Now, look, I, I know you've probably looked into this a little bit, but I kind of really need you to hear this for the first time, okay? To get a clear picture of what Yeshua is saying, because this could be very dry and academic. Okay, I'm the gate. I get it, Rabbi. I go... You know me, the last thing I want to be is dry and academic. First of all, I'm not from the academia, you know? I'm not, I'm a D's, Dems, and Do's from the Bronx. And I want you to feel God. I want you to feel him. I feel him. I feel him right now. And I want you to feel him. Because to taste him and to feel him is a game changer. So it's important that that we understand a little bit about his ancient culture. Now, there's something called context that I go over with you all the time. When you read verses, you have to read the verses before and after, and not just one or two, to really understand what it means. But there's something bigger than just 
reading in context is something called contextual culture or cultural contextualization. It's real fancy, but I've been now to every, you know, like 40 countries all over the world. Each country has its own colloquialisms, its own sayings, its own metaphors, if you will. If, if you say to somebody in India, if I'm translating and I'm speaking English and they translate for me in Telugu and then in the body and I say, I'm going to kill two birds at one stone, what do you think they think? They're looking around for a couple of birds and they're waiting for you to pick up a rock and nail both of them with one throw. But if, if I say to Burn, look, you're going over to Walmart, would you mind stopping at Walgreens for me? Because then she would be killing two birds at one stone. It's colloquialism in our culture. You follow? So I'm not trying to be a hammerhead, but you have to understand, this book was written by Jews to Jews in a Jewish place. And if you think with a Gentile mind, you're not going to get it. You're going to have a lot of academics. You're going to have a lot of head knowledge. You're going to have a lot of theology and a lot of doctrine. And you're going to have like a cold, stanky heart for the Lord. You're not going to have the intimacy with God. You're going to be part of the frozen chosen. This will defrost you. Okay. Of all the domesticated animals, and I mean all, sheep are the most helpless. There is nothing more helpless than sheep. And how are we referred to? Now, some of you I know, you know, you're good old boys, you're tough boys, you're self-made, and you think you're pretty strong. But God doesn't want you to think like that. That's wrong thinking. He doesn't want you to think bad about yourself. But do you feel helpless? Because I do. And I think a lot of you are raising families, and you're helpless. You think you know so much. You don't know squat, but you're acting like you do. And you're faking it. It's not working. It's just giving you anxiety. Just let God know how helpless you are, and he'll help you. But if you have it, he'll say, okay, you got it. Sheep will spend the entire day grazing. Sheep will eat and eat and eat. So, so far we're helpless. Sheep wander from place to place with no purpose. They just do stuff. They just wander around. Also, they never look up. Almost sounds like they had cell phones, huh? I mean, think about people today. They don't look up. And they just go from place, I got to go here, I got to go here, I got to run an errand, I got to run an errand. I got to keep running errands, accomplishing very little. Running errands, head down, eating. I got to eat. I got to go here. I got to go head down. Aimless. As a result, because of this, sheep often become lost. You know, we get saved and, and we feel, okay, we're safe. We lose our way a lot. If you ever go to the beach, usually you go out to the water. We lived on the beach. I'm a water guy. When I was at the Gulf, I like to swim out a half a mile and then swim a mile across. I like to be all the way out there. When you go sometimes out from your blanket and you're playing and you're playing and then you turn, you go, wow, my blanket's over there. Because you drifted. But you didn't know because you didn't feel the current. That's what happens in our life. We drift. We don't want to admit it. Like, I'm, I'm good. I'm solid with the Lord. I'm on it. It's so easy to drift and not even realize. It happens to the best of them. So sheep get lost. But this is the interesting thing about sheep. They have no homing device. None. No homing instinct as other animals do. So they're totally incapable of finding their way back to the sheepfold. Even when it's in plain sight. Even when you point, it's right over there. They can't get there. It, these are important things to know because Yeshua is constantly teaching in parables. 
just earthly stories with heavenly meanings. He's always using symbolism. Back then it was agriculture. He's letting the people know, you're sheep. And he's also letting them know, don't fret. You have a really good shepherd if you'll let me lead. They desperately need a shepherd to lead them back to safety. You see, for me, guys, I was just telling this somebody else yesterday. I mean, I don't, I know it almost sounds boisterous or boasting or arrogant or, or spiritual. Look, I was totally, I was, I was so confident you have no idea. If I was on a job interview and the guy said, what do you see yourself in five years? I said, on the other side of the desk. I kid you not. I was really confident and very self-centered. I didn't think I was mean. I wasn't a mean-spirited person. I was helpful, but when you're selfish, you end up hurting people without even realizing it. This was a total catharsis. This was a total metamorphosis. This was like I went from being incredibly confident to being incredibly not confident. I went from totally totally selfish to being selfless. I went from wanting to take care of just myself to having a a fairly large family and a congregational leader. Overnight, it was like, what is going on? But make no mistake, as unconfident as I am in myself, I will not trust myself. I am very, very, very extremely confident in the Lord. By nature, sheep are followers. You know, I'm telling you, if a sheep steps off a cliff, the other sheep will follow. How many here are at least 60 years old? How many times have you heard from your mother, if your friend steps off a cliff, will you step off too? If I was a sheep, I'd answer yes. (laughs) Yes, mom. That's bad. Also, sheep are very susceptible to injuries. They are utterly helpless against predators. You are helpless against the enemy. You have to let the Lord fight your battles. You have to hide in the shadow of his wings. You cannot cannot outsmart. Listen, if you think you could outsmart the enemy, he's already outsmarted you. He's already got you. If a wolf enters a pen, the sheep will not defend themselves. They won't try to even run away or spread out. In fact, what they do is they huddle together to make the slaughter all the more easy. Sheep are totally dependent upon the shepherd who tends them with care and compassion. Shepherds, back in this day, when Yeshua was speaking, were the providers, they were the guides, They were the protectors, and they were the constant companions of the sheep. They had an incredible, intimate friendship. So close was the bond between a shepherd and the sheep that to this day, to this very day, and I've seen it, Middle Eastern shepherds can divide their flocks that have mingled at a well simply by calling their sheep by name. It's unbelievable. You could have 30 sheep at a well, and the shepherd comes, and he has eight of them, and he calls them, and just the eight will come to him. Why do you think when Yeshua said, my sheep know my voice? The voice is the most distinctive thing about a person, not their gait, their voice. That's why when you speak to your baby when it's in the womb, they already know you. They recognize your voice. Shepherds were inseparable from their flocks. Inseparable. The shepherd would lead the sheep to safe places to graze and then make them lie, make them lie down for several hours in a shady place. Some of you don't know when to lie down. Some of you may lie down too much. Some of you may lie down when the Lord wants you to move. Some of you might move when the Lord wants you to lie down. Just like some of you turn over a table when he wants you to sit and eat. Some of you sit and eat when he wants you to turn it over. If you're led by the shepherd, you won't have to question. 
You don't have to question. But you have to die to yourself. Otherwise, you won't hear his voice. You'll continue to hear yours. You can't hear two voices in your head. I, I can't have two of my children talking at once. I just can't. It doesn't work for me. First of all, I'm massively ADD, so it doesn't work. But I go, hold on. And, and if Burns talking to me and one of them comes in, I just put up my finger. And they know I'm trying to focus on what Burns saying. Once I'm done, then I can listen to you. I, I like to spend time with people one-on-one. -on -one. I can really listen. I can so hear what they're saying. But when too many voices are going on, so if your voice is speaking and God's voice is speaking, how are you going to discern the difference? It's not easy. Not easy. When night would fall, after the shepherd would lead their sheep to graze and relax, the shepherd would lead the sheep to the protection of a sheepfold. Now, I know this sounds kind of technical. Really, I don't want it to be. But there were two kinds of sheepfolds in the first century. There was the sheepfold that was public that was found in the cities. Okay? The sheepfolds in the cities, like most cities, they were large because you have more sheep. And they were large enough to hold several flocks at night. So the sheep pen in the city would be in the care of a door or gatekeeper. That's what they were known as, the gatekeeper. And the duty of the gatekeeper was to keep guard, guard the door to the sheep pen during the night, and to admit the shepherds in the morning, and then the shepherds would come and call their respective sheep with their voice, who knew the shepherd's voice, and then lead them out to pasture. Same thing, lead them out to pasture, they graze, they relax, bring them back in at night where they're safe, but he'd stand by the door. Now, Yeshua wasn't a city slicker. He's a country guy. He's from Nazareth. The town only had 200 people. The Galilee is still untouched. Some of you are going to see. It's untouched. 2,000 years, it looks the same. It was villages. In the countryside, it wasn't the sheep pen like in the city. The shepherds would keep their flocks in the sheep pen in the countryside. But this type of sheep pen was nothing more than a rough circle of rocks. Very makeshift. And it was piled up into a wall, and there was a small opening, but there was no door. Through it, the shepherd would drive the sheep at nightfall, but since there was no gate to close to protect the sheep, the shepherd would keep the sheep in and wild animals out by laying across the opening. In essence, he would sleep there all night, literally becoming the gate to the sheep, responsible for their safety and well-being. In this context, Yeshua is saying that not only is he the gate of the sheep, but he's the good shepherd as well. Which brings us to the next I Am declaration. Look at John 10, 11. It says, I am the good shepherd. First he says, I'm the, I'm, I'm the gateway into the sheepfold. But I'm also, I sleep there, man. I don't, I'm not going to give it to anybody else. I'm going to stay and watch over you. Nobody else. I'm your shepherd. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, so we have this fourth I am declaration, again, speaking about Yeshua's unique identity and purpose. So Yeshua not only describes himself as a good shepherd, but the good shepherd, there's not another that can make that claim. Now, this word good is thrown around in our vocabulary. We, we need to look it up in the Greek because the New Testament is written in Greek. But it's the same word basically in the Hebrew. Same definition. I just want you to know that. Tov in the, in the Hebrew is the same definition. Okay, kalos, as he's saying, he's saying beautiful, excellent, eminent choice, surpassing, commendable, and genuine. Huge words. Now, we throw around good. Bernadette and I stopped in a little town on the way back, Colquitt, Georgia. Anybody ever been to Colquitt? Wow. <laughs> I met a lady there the last year we drove through, and she remembered us. My mother always said, you, you leave a lasting impression on people, good or bad, but you, they will remember you. And she was lovely, and she prepared some food for us. We were the only ones in there. You know, Colquitt is a bustling metropolis. I don't know how we got in without a reservation. And um, it was delicious. It was delicious. And so I say delicious, but a lot of people would have said, wow, that mac and cheese was so good. But the mac and cheese wasn't beautiful. 
wasn't eminent or commendable or genuine. So we throw this term around. So when he's saying I'm, he's the good shepherd, we don't really get the full force because we use it so routinely and so flippantly. It's, it's not really common, that word. God would never throw that word around. When you say God is good, you're making a huge statement. You know, we say a lot of things are good. Like, we don't even mean they're excellent. Like, we go, the pizza was good. Yeah, the wedding was good. It means it was okay. But that's not, you, don't, you can't, Western thinking and Eastern thinking is different, man. And it's dangerous when you make it routine. Because then your faith is haphazard. Hey, yeah, Yeshua is Lord, hallelujah. What time is the game? It should never be that way, man. Never. I don't care how long you're a believer. You know, I used to say I'm not a believer long because I was a believer five. I'm a believer 30 years. I love the Lord now more than ever. I'm married 30 years. I love Bernadette now more than ever. There's no question I love her more now. I mean, she's finally understood how this thing works, so it's... Yeshua is saying, I'm the beautiful shepherd. I'm the excellent shepherd. I'm the eminent shepherd. I'm the choice shepherd. I'm the surpassing shepherd. I'm the commendable shepherd. And I am the genuine shepherd. You see, a sheep can turn over on its back and not be able to get up again. If a sheep turns over on its back, it cannot turn over by itself. It is referred to cast down, where we get the word downcast. Do you recognize that word? Psalm 42, Psalm 43, why so downcast, O my soul? Now, you don't know what that means. Because you don't know the terminology. You think that means, oh, sad. It's bigger than sad. It means, I can't get up. It's not like, well, this day didn't work out really well. I, I went, I drove an hour and a half, and I got there late. Now I didn't get in on time. And No, 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 no. That's not downcast. No, that's, that's just a little inconvenience. There's tons of inconveniences. That's not downcast. Downcast means you are down and out and there's no way for you to recover. That's downcast. A downcast or a cast down sheep is a very pathetic sight. Have anybody seen this? It's pathetic. They lie on their back and their feet are in the air and they flay frantically, struggling to get up, but they can't. Impossible. No success. Once they go into panic mode, I'm sure some of you can relate to this, The body starts, and the sheep starts to produce these gases, and it causes the legs to lose circulation, and they become somewhat paralyzed. Have you ever heard fear sometimes could paralyze a person? They can't move. It's like they got to lay down. They can't think. This is what happens to us. This is what Yeshua is teaching. By the way, do you know what causes a sheep to become downcast? It's caused by the sheep being overweight and constantly looking for soft areas to lie down in. (laughs) We as a society have become unbelievably too comfortable. We buy comfortable shoes and comfortable beds and comfortable everything. It's all about our comfort. But I'm telling you, if the crap hits the fan, and I believe it will soon, it's dangerous to be comfortable. I'm not a political guy, but I'm here to tell you this election is crucial more than you know. This, this, I believe God ordains people. And I believe if we make a wrong move this time, you heard it here today, it'll be God's judgment on America.
Don't vote personally, man. Vote with the heart of God. If the shepherd, when a sheep is downcast, if a shepherd does not arrive on the scene within a reasonably short period of time, the sheep will die. They can't stay in that position too long. If one or two sheep are missing, the first thought to flash in the shepherd's mind is, one of my sheep is cast somewhere. And they leave right away and they search to set it on its feet again. And it's not only the shepherd who keeps a sharp eye for the cast sheep, the predators do as well. Buzzards, dogs, coyotes, cougars, they all know that a cast sheep is easy prey and death is not far off. Your enemy always goes after the easy target. He's a total bully, and he'll kick you when you're down. And if he can't get to you, he'll get to your kids. So knowing all this, knowing how they're vulnerable to attack and close to death, it makes the whole problem of the cast sheep very serious for the shepherd. The good shepherd is quick and ready to its rescue. Very tender, very compassionate, very helpful. But what does it mean when Yeshua calls himself the good shepherd? Look at the next few verses. John 10, 12 through 13, it says, The hired hand, since he isn't a shepherd, is the sheep aren't his own. They see the wolf coming, and he abandons the sheep and run away. This is very telling, guys. Unbelievably, what Yeshua is saying here is rich, deep, and very convicting. Then the wolf drags them off and scatters them. What he's saying to these folks, these Jewish folks in the first century, they thoroughly understand. There is no explanation needed like we have to today. He says the hired worker, the hireling, behaves like this because that's all he is. A hired worker. Ask somebody who owns a company. I have friends here who own a company. You ain't got no employees that run it like you. You've got good employees. Some of you got great employees, but you own the thing. Nobody's taking care of my kids like I do or like Byrne does. Nobody's going to run the synagogue like me. Uh-uh. We live and breathe it. So it doesn't matter to him what happens to the sheep. It doesn't matter. Listen to what Yeshua is saying. Yeshua is making a contrast, a huge contrast between himself and the religious leaders of his day. He is making a thorough accusation. He compares the religious leaders to hirelings or hired hands who don't care all that much about the sheep. The hirelings are contrasted with the true and faithful shepherd. He who is a hireling works for wages, which is his main consideration. His concern is not for the sheep, but for himself. There are many in the church today who choose ministry as a comfortable occupation without true love for the sheep. They go from church to church. They figure out where they want to live. God's never asked me. I have never in 30 years ever heard God with all the conversation we've had, and I'm talking daily conversation. Hey, Greg, what do you think? I kid you not. We don't have that luxury. I can't put together a resume and decide, well, I think I'm going to, and then my pension, then it will kick in, and then I'll go live here, and then we'll try and live there. I don't have that luxury. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying that's not the way Messianic Judaism works. I stand before you today, and I declare and proclaim that ministry is anything but a comfortable occupation. If you are not called to ministry, it could very well be the worst job in the world. I'd rather be picking up elephant dung at the circus than being in ministry if I wasn't called. Now, I'm, you know, there might be somebody who watches that picks up elephant dung. So, before we get totally down on the guy who picks up elephant dung at the circus... I want to share with you something about elephant dung. 
it can actually be quite useful. I've met elephants in Tanzania, in India, where they roam free, okay? Elephant dung is a tremendous mosquito repellent. If you ever find yourself in the jungle and something tells me, probably most of you won't, and you light up some elephant dung, say farewell to the muzis. Interestingly enough, it's odorless. Two, elephant dung can be used in the wilderness as life-saving water. It's saturated with water and, interestingly enough, carries no bacteria. Let's hope you never have to find that out. But this is Rabbi Greg's personal favorite. It is being used currently to make coffee in the Golden Triangle of Thailand under the name Black Ivory Coffee, and it's being sold at $500 a pound. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to have Black Ivory Coffee, but I have had Kopi Luwak Coffee, or better known as Cat Poop Coffee. Yeah, these, these... Asian cats called the palm civet, eat it, they don't digest it, they excrete it, you clean it off, and it's the coffee berries that once was eaten and excreted by the cat. Now, to be honest with you, it did not taste good. (laughs) And, And for some reason, I just don't see anybody going, hey, let's go to Starbucks and getting some cat poop frappuccino. So if you scoop up the elephant dung. Now getting back to ministry and being comfortable, this is what I tell young people, even some old people who just think this is ministry. I don't know how they thought this because they're ignorant. And ignorant isn't stupid. They could be highly intelligent. But they're ignoring the truth. They don't know what it is. Just like, do you think the average person knows what it is to be a parent? They think it's going to see us and getting pictures I mean, I don't even understand when people say I slept like a baby last night. Does that mean you got up every three hours hungry, crying, and wet? <laughs> but you know, you see people. It's, it's almost fun to have a kid who has a kid. Because then you'd be like, <laughs> now you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll take them. Fill them up with ice cream and soda and give them back to you. <laughs> because nobody tells you listen i'm waiting for a course in high school to teach kids how to communicate you think it's all about mathematics and science people are never taught how to communicate then they get married they don't know how to communicate they don't know how to talk things out especially today and they they learn as they go along but usually it doesn't work out it fails So people think this is ministry. Oh, I get to have a microphone and talk to people and everybody listens. Yeah, this is ministry for an hour, one day a week. This isn't ministry. Oh my God, if this is ministry, I'd love it. This is the easy part. But you're not a minister, are you? So you don't have a clue, really. Just like somebody who's not a parent doesn't... Re- I mean, you could give advice from a book, but no. Mm-mm. you got to have a kid and raise a kid to understand what it means to be a parent. I'm sorry. I tell people that come up to me, oh, Rabbi, I feel called to ministry. I go, oh, okay, well, look, this is what I suggest. You run away from it as far and as fast as you can, and if you end up in the belly of a great fish, then maybe you're called. A person doesn't choose ministry. Ministry chooses the person. And in Messianic Judaism, man, this, it's not big places. This is an anomaly. that We know it's small. A lot of us have to be bivocational. I was bivocational for years. When Bernadette had a car, I rode a bike. Now you see me drive an Explorer. You're like, oh, I'm 60 after 30 years. You didn't see me riding my single-speed beach cruiser to the synagogue. You never saw that, did you? Don't be too quick to judge. You have no clue what another person's going through. Not just me, any of you. How are you so quick? If God was as quick as you are, you wouldn't be here. It's just like, it's almost mean-spirited. You know? How did you become such a critic? 
How are you so right all the time? Do you ever hear yourself? And your wife has to listen to that all the time? She's going to listen to that for a season, and she's going to get tired of it. And that goes for you too, wifey. He's listening, but he ain't happy. Look at the 14th and the 15th verse. We're almost there. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life on behalf of the sheep. Yeshua compares his relationship with his sheep, us, to his relationship with the Father. He's saying that the same union, communion, and intimacy that he has with the Father can exist between us and the Father. That's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. I don't know what to say. The shepherds of ancient time were not usually the owners of the flock. They did not own the flock. They were wealthy. So they hired somebody. You know how people do that, right? Get me a nanny. Wait a minute, sweet pea. You don't work. So? Yikes. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they were expected to exercise the same care and concern over the sheep that the owners would. That was the expectation. This was the character of a true shepherd. However, some of the hirelings only thought of themselves. So as a result, when a wolf appeared, the hireling would abandon the flock and flee, leaving the sheep to be scattered or killed. Ordinarily, the sheep were called upon in the first century to lay down their lives for the shepherd. But Yeshua, he does the exact opposite. He lays down his life for the sheep. Now, if you're you're hearing what I'm saying... You might be thinking, so Yeshua would leave the 99 for the one, right? But in actuality, it's a totally different context. And I, I don't mean a little different. You would think, and I know this is the thing in, in, in most believing circles, so do not feel bad, that if Yeshua had 100 sheep in his flock, right, and 99 are good, 99 are safe in the sheepfold, and one may be cast, I'm going to leave the 99 and go after the one. But this is what I want to teach you, more important than anything else. Look at Luke 15 and we're done. You need to understand this so that when you read the Bible, you don't misinterpret it. Because this is totally, totally different, okay? The tax collectors and sinners kept gathering to hear Yeshua. And the perishim, these are the religious leaders of their day, okay? These are the priests and the pastors of the day. And the Torah teachers kept grumbling. This fellow, they said, welcomes sinners. He even eats with them. Now, I don't want to get too into it, but there's three, there's three aspects to a person's home in, in Judaism, especially in the first century, okay? You have like a den. That's like the outer courtyard. Then you have the table. That's the holy place. And then you have the bedroom. That's the holy of holies. Now, I used to visit a lot of people. I don't do it as much anymore. I don't have the time that we used to when we were a little tiny. But I'd be at somebody's house all the time. And they'd always give me a tour of the house. I would never step foot in the bedroom. In fact, I'm uncomfortable on the threshold. I'm uncomfortable. And they sometimes look at me and I try to explain to them. I go, look, that's an intimate place. I don't need to be in there. I don't even need to see it. I don't need to see your bedroom furniture. Please, if you wouldn't mind, lock the door. Now, the, 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 the table, you don't just invite anybody to sit at your table. That's a place of intimacy. Our table, that's for our family and for close friends and for somebody we want to bless, but that's a place of intimacy. That's where we talk. That's where we talk about our day, and we have table time every night. Vern makes a meal, thank God, and it's not just a meal. It's a time to sit and talk so we stay connected. So he's saying he even eats with them. That's what the Jewish people are saying, the leaders. Man, he doesn't only talk to them. He'll sit with them in intimacy. You follow? This, this is a big deal. If you don't know that about that, it's not a big, so big deal he eats with them. You, you almost make fun of them. Oh, he eats with them. No, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. A Jew was not allowed to step foot in a Gentile's house. When Peter went to Cornelius' house, that was a big deal. When Yeshua spoke to the Samaritan woman, that was a big deal. Not only did they not talk to Gentiles, but he would never speak to a woman alone, a rabbi. Never, ever. So he told them this parable. What's a parable? Just an earthly story with a heavenly message. It uses symbolism to teach a spiritual message. So he tells them a parable. Because the religious leaders are grumbling. If one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? 
Let's continue. When he finds it, he joyfully hoists it onto his shoulders, and when he gets home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, and they, he has a celebration because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who turns to God from his sins than over 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. Now, when you think of this, when you first thought of this, you think the 99, they're in the sheepfold. No, the 99 are the religious leaders who were too proud and too holy to repent. They didn't need repentance. They're holy. They're holy men. They go to church. They've got a Bible. They got a fish on the back of the car. They're members. They tithe. They're deacons, some of them. He is making a huge accusation. Overt sinners were attracted to Yeshua. He never, ever minced words. He did reprove their sins, and they agreed with him. He did reprove their sins, and he agreed. They agreed. But there was something about mercy they saw in the midst of judgment. There was something about this tender, loving, compassionate heart that they were drawn to. Sinners were drawn to him. Religious people couldn't stand him because he saw right through their nonsense. He saw right through their religious facade. But sinners were attracted to him. They came to him. And they would take sides against themselves. The religious leaders chose not to show them grace. They were social and moral lepers. Some of you like, I'll catch something. What about them catching what you got? Instead of you worrying about you catching what they got. Stay away from them. Just go to church. Go to Bible study. Go to fellowship. Stay away. They're moral and social lepers. And so are you. Every single solitary soul in this building and outside of this building is a social and moral leper that has been absolutely, positively saved by the grace of God. You go to an AA meeting, they don't say I'm sober, they say I am an alcoholic. You are a sinner, not past tense. And let me tell you something else. The greatest sinners I meet, to me, I look at them and go, this is a future trophy in God's case of grace. And they know from what they've been saved from. They fall on their face daily and say, oh my God, thank you. But the religious leaders, no, they don't get it. They don't get it. We're all downcast, guys, if we're willing to admit it. And if we're willing to admit it, we get a free ride on Yeshua's shoulders. What can you compare to that? The message is clear. There is tremendous joy in heaven when just one little lamb repents of their sin. But there is absolutely no joy over the 99 sinners who choose not to. Let's stand together. You know, I know that it's not so easy to go home and study this or study during the week, but there's some, there's some things you'll see that I just can't. The Holy Spirit will bring out things. You know, when you're downcast, you can't get up. I know you think, no, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to walk towards God, and I'm going to repent. He comes after you. He comes after you, I promise you. And I'm not saying the greasy grace thing and hyper grace and just do whatever you want, he'll come. I'm telling you, when you're downcast and you're laying there and you're saying, Yeshua, come and help me, please, he's already on his way before you asked. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the principal peace, Yeshua. Vehunecha Yesa Adonoi Ponovelecha Viasem Lecha 
Shalom. Shabbat shalom, guys.